speaker today is Christine Bowman. She's the local history and genealogy specialist at Maslin Public Library. And thanks to all your cohorts for being here today. That's very nice. We welcome them. Um, she develops and maintains a collection of reference materials for research and teaches classes on genealogy and local history. I just love the local history room at the library. It's just the sweetest room, and it's just chock full of easily accessible resources. So. Special place. Christine has degrees in English and history from Kent State University. She taught history and humanities courses at Kent State University Start Campus and the University of Akron while she was working for the Tuscarawas County Public Library. Now she continues to teach at Kent Start and she maintains the Maslin Heritage Foundation archives at Five Oaks. So you have a whole room full of people who are connected in so many ways. Thank you for being here. This is Christine Bowman. <clears throat> I'm going to warn you, I don't usually speak with a microphone. I will try. <laughs> I usually am used to a classroom, so that doesn't require a microphone. Um, this research, I'm going to warn you, I am still researching, just like with any genealogy, you're never really done, right? So you guys are getting mid-research report. How's that? Looking into Ohio, I used to focus on U.S. history more at the federal level, and a few years ago, something hit me, right? That I really needed to look more closely at home, at Ohio, and the importance of Ohio in history. And this is part of that process. So is my job at the library. So I'm learning and, and getting to know a lot about the Maslin area, working there. So why Ohio? That's a question that a lot of younger people still ask today, and I try to convince them that Ohio has a very important piece, a very important part, I guess, in our history. And after the Revolutionary War, you're gonna see a big migration. People are moving west. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. There's a lot of history before. I'll give you a little synopsis of that. And then I'd like to end today with a little bit of a closer look at some of the names you might recognize, some more local individuals. Sound good? Also, fair warning, I am a social, cultural, sometimes political historian, and I don't really do military or math. Okay? So don't ask me about military. When it's talking about all the acres and stuff, I have to figure that 10 times over. No military, no math. So Ohio country, one of the names used to talk about the Northwest um, prior to 1787. Sorry, I got away from that microphone. Um, there were some obstacles, though, to settlement. I do it this way. Um, one, this was an uncultivated wilderness. Actually, prior to 1783, you know, with the proclamation of 1763, you had the British trying not to settle this area, to leave it unsettled. Um, transportation, a bit of a problem. What do you think? Maybe. Um, sorry. I Got to move over here for a second because I know there's stuff I want to tell you. Um, with transportation, right, this is going to be resolved over time. First, you have roads. Um, I have Zane's Trace. I use this map. It's 1923, so it's a little bit further ahead than what we're talking about today. But I liked it because you can see Zane's Trace on here, which is a road opened in 1797. Probably more familiar, the National Road or the Cumberland Road cutting across. And I also like this because one of the big things to help transportation in Ohio, canals, and then later railroads. And then you can see on this map too, some of that. So I jumped ahead just so that we would have that. So it took a little while, but transportation would get resolved. I did look at newspapers at one point, and there was one in, I believe it was Philadelphia, that was writing up the 
this article, and it was talking about how the transportation on rivers in Ohio, this was 1791, it was as good as, and it was talking about this place in England. So they're trying to sell it then, right? They really want people to come here. Territorial disputes. Well, there were a lot of those. Between the states themselves, you had four states. You had Virginia, Connecticut, New York, and Massachusetts, all claiming parts of the Western territories. Um, those are going to resolve um, those claims around the 1780s you're having them fighting the British. They don't really have time to fight each other over the claims. They, they do make some proposals. It takes a little bit of time. They offer, um, Virginia offers a piece, but with a, an exception for their, the, for land they want to keep, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Um, but by the 1780s, you're getting this part resolved. The British, the British are still here. Even after the war is over, they're going to stay somewhat illegally. <laughs> and they're going to stir things up with the tribes that are in the Northwest, um, kind of a precursor to the War of 1812. Um, also Native Americans. This is going to be resolved in a series of treaties. Um, I could go on, there's, you know, that topic for a long time, but that's not the story we're telling today. But you do end up with the Northwest Indian War, before it's all over, um, a lot more treaties. A lot of the maps you'll see, the Northwest becomes the area of the state that's reserved for the tribes. And then eventually, Ohio, um, it's often referred to as the Other Trail of Tears. There's a book even written with that title. If anybody needs recommendations for what to read, see me at the library. I can make lots. <laughs> so all of this ends up resolving and to what we call the public domain, right? These are, this is territory that is not a state, but is held in common in ownership by the other states. Are we good? Any questions so far? So it was called the Ohio Country. That's one of the names. I mean, originally even the Crown Lands, before when it was still British, um, Ohio Country, um, trying to think of all the names that were used. I actually, that country is another one that was often used, the Western Territory. With the uh, Northwest Ordinance, that's when you get that name more solidified. Oh, I forgot to read this. This I found actually in Barb Whitman's book. Yeah, thank you, Barb. Um, this Margaret Van Horn Dwight wrote in her journal in 1810. We found the road's past description worse than you can possibly imagine. It has grown so cold that I feel we shall perish tomorrow. I have concluded the reason so few are willing to return from the Western country is not that the country is so good, because the journey is so bad. <laughs> so that tells you about the roads. What do you think? Ah, so now the Northwest Territory. This is a lot of stuff I'm going to kind of summarize for you because it kind of predates what we want to talk about. Um, but you have a series of ordinances and acts that kind of organize the Northwest Territory. The ordinances are really a framework for the settlement and government. You have the first in 1784. I kind of made a list here, but I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But this is an early effort to deal with the territory that's north and west of the Ohio River. And at this time, squatters are a problem. And I do have them on another slide, too, to talk about. Um, but everybody knows what a squatter is, right? Comes in, claims land, well, illegally. Jefferson is the one who authored the Ordinance of 1784. And I had to put this up here. Um, this is his proposal for 10 states with names like Polypotamia. <laughs> so we would, I think, live in looks like Washington, maybe? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, uh, Metropotamia, right? Yeah. Just in case. You know, Michigan, that doesn't seem too off. Uh, Illinois, yeah, Saratoga. But my favorite is Polypotamia. I don't know why, I just like that one. So in this ordinance, it starts to deal with the territory, but it fails to address a lot of important elements, like how they would distribute the land. 
Um, it does offer the same rights to these potential states, right? They're gonna be, become states eventually and they would have the same rights as the original 13, guaranteed self-government, and this says no slavery after 1800. The Ordinance of 1785 is going to make some improvements and its big deal is that it establishes the rules for survey, sale, and settlement of the land, which the first one kind of forgot to do. Um, it is going to set it up to divide the territory into townships of six miles square. Section 16 set aside for schools. This sound familiar to you guys? You've heard this before? Yeah. Sections 8, 11, 26, and 29 would be reserved for Congress's use. And I've read several different accounts of what that would be used for, but basically the one that made the most sense to me was holding it back for them to maybe sell later or to use, you know, as revenue. I also have read that they used them for compensating Revolutionary War soldiers, but I haven't found any documentation on that, you know, outside of the military districts. Um, and then the remaining land would be sold, and this is an initial price, a dollar per acre. It goes up, and then it comes way down when we get to the 1860s, right? Way down to free. <laughs> and this one says slavery ends now in the Northwest Territory. And that's important for a particular group. Anybody able to tell me what group that might be? Quakers. Quakers. Yeah, Ohio becomes very appealing to Quakers and other abolitionists because of that. Nepper, Dr. Nepper, if you're familiar with that name, George Nepper, considers this one of the most significant acts of legislation ever passed. He listed a couple others, but that seems pretty significant. Yeah. And then the Northwest Ordinance of 1787 is going to give you the governmental structure and the process for them to become states. It further elaborates on those rights. It divides the group more like what we have today. No polypotamia. Sorry. And this ordinance is what's going to really accelerate westward expansion. The acts um, well, I want to go back here for a second. The surveying systems. Ohio has probably the most forms of surveying used within the state than any other. And I'm going to explain why here over the next few slides that might be. Um, anybody familiar with meets and bounds? I like to describe that. See that rock over there? Well, that, that rock and that tree, that's my property. You think there's a lot of problems with meets and bounds? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now people from Virginia might argue, I don't know. But you're going to have the implementation here in Ohio as of the rectangular system, right? And this becomes the basis for the US moving forward. And this is where you're gonna have townships, most six miles square, but we'll talk about Connecticut's problems later. Um, 36 sections, this is where I had to do some math, it hurt. <laughs> Why was it whittled down from, what, were there nine sections up there to begin with, and then it ended up as four states? Well, it ended up, it went it basically in half. There were like ten, he was, he was proposing ten, and it ended up being five. As far as why the divisions changed, I'm not sure. I mean, this was just Jefferson's idea here. Yeah, he was putting it on paper, but what ended up... Okay, this yeah. happened within three years, right? Uh, uh, of seven. Well, yeah, because he's making a proposal here. Right. And this is what, you know, this is the idea ahead of time, and this was the reality. Did he have two terms? Was it followed up by the next president? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, when I'm speaking, I'm sorry, my brain gets so focused on what I'm covering and my, I'm focused on the fact that I have 50 pages of stuff that I, I'm drawing a blank. Okay. I'll get with you afterwards. Okay. How's that? Because then my brain will be working again. <laughs> it's the worst time for your brain to stop in the middle of a presentation. Yeah. So Ohio, 
I always thought of Ohio as being a guinea pig, right, all these things, but I was reading one of the books and, and it referred to Ohio as a social laboratory. And I thought, well, that's a good term for it. Because it is the first public domain state, they're gonna try a lot of things out here. We were an experiment, yeah? And one of those experiments was the surveying I talked about. Yeah. If you were in the Virginia Military District, well, they still use the meets and bounds. That district is right here. Virginia, as I said, had claims to this area. And part of that resolution, it went back and forth. It took three years for them to actually cede the land because they had to negotiate. So with that resolution, they got to keep this piece of land as a military district, and that means it was used to reward soldiers, right? Um, those from Virginia and from Maryland who participated in the revolution. So that's the, the purpose of this big piece here. And they did still use meets and bounds there, and there were problems, property disputes, Connecticut Western Reserve up here, you can see Akron is part of that. And then you also have this little piece here that also goes to, with Connecticut, the Firelands. Um, the Firelands, there were nine towns in Connecticut that were burned, destroyed by the British, and this land is set aside to compensate those people. The Seven Ranges, highlighted because it's the first one where they're gonna try out this new system of surveying, right? It's the first they're gonna survey, the first to use the new system, so it's a big first there. The seven ranges, it's gonna be kind of over in this area here. The Ohio Company, I have a slide for them. I count them as some of the people who came, right? So we have a whole slide we can talk about them, provided I don't use all my time up. Um, so we will talk about them and the donation tracked here in a little bit. The Sims Purchase, which is kind of right over here, one of the big things to remember about Judge Sims is he wanted to go ahead and pay for that before he, he had to have, want to have the money before he had to pay the government. So he may have sold some land that he didn't quite have title to yet, which could have caused problems, maybe. Um, the United States Military District, different and separate from the Virginia, right? You get the state level and then federal level and the refugee tract, the refugee tract is when you have um, Canadians who had sided with the Americans during the war, they gave them the opportunity to settle there. And then the rest, if you don't fall into one of these other survey districts, you would be in the Congress lands, and that's where we fall. And that is for Congress to utilize. Um, one of the big things, and I'll talk about this again on another slide, I always steal my own thunder, the country didn't have a lot of money. They had a lot of land, right, but not much money. So they would use these lands, right, as revenue. Push and pull factors. Okay, so this is when groups migrate. Something's pushing them out of where they are, and that you still have to have a pull factor to pull them to where they end up. So in the East, the economy was slow to recover after the war, um, high unemployment rates. Fast forward a little bit, the embargo of 1807 was not popular. Um, that was under Jefferson and that caused more economic issues. Um, there was increased population density. I have a hard time thinking to, about today, right? How many people we have in the country, in the world, and think they ran out of space? What are you talking about? But there is an increase, increased population density. The soil itself, especially in New England, wasn't the greatest. They didn't practice crop rotation, right? So th there was soil exhaustion issues. And by 1775, most of the available land was already under cultivation there. The federal government, okay, starting with the Treaty of Paris 1783, you have a change, right, a shift. They want people there. They want individuals to settle. Unlike the British who had been limiting 
Um, they've acquired this land, now they need to people it, they need to claim it to make it theirs. They want a defensive barrier. That happens a lot in history, right? Let's send these people out there. They'll give us some protection. Dollar poor, land rich. A genealogy colleague of mine has a presentation that she does. That's why that's in quotes, and that's what it's named. And that's why I really like that name, right? Dollar poor, land rich. That was our country. <laughs> How do we pay these people? Give them some land. Remember the early Congress, the Confederation Congress, right before the Constitution? Um, they couldn't tax. So that's problematic. How do you pay for things if you can't tax? And an American ideology is a key part of this. Land. The notion of land. It's very ingrained in us, isn't it? This idea of property. Um, there's an idea that, too, here, that if they could have some land, they might be able to better weather, to better survive the ups and downs in the economy. This quote here kind of helps, you know, for those with the freedom and the resources to get hold of it, abundant land was an emblem of escape from the restraints of older, more crowded societies. And of course, a draw for some, the fact that slavery was not practiced here. I like this graph just because, right, it kind of gets into some of the things I already mentioned, right? Depleted soil, excess pop population, but it kind of shows you the ups and downs of the economy. I was supposed to take 10 minutes for that part. It took 15. Oop. So here it is. This piece, and I am still researching this, so we're not going to talk a lot about it today. There are two individuals in this audience who played a huge role in my interest here. Um, I had a patron at the library who came in and told me this story. I'm allowed to say your name, right? All right, Glenn Farney. If anybody knows Glenn from Stanwood. He came in and he told me this great story about Stanwood and where it got its name and about the Oberlands and the stands and the woods. And I got all excited. I actually have goosebumps right now. And then he, I thought, that's a great story. I think a month later he comes in again, like, tell me that story again. Yeah, because I didn't write it down. And then about the third time I asked him, I said, you know what? I, I'm going to do some research here. I need to write this down. And probably also he's tired of telling me the story, right? So I'm going to tell you the story he told me. And I'm still researching this story. So this is a work in progress. All right, so I do have some of the documents here, right? Um, this is Tuscarawas Township. You guys are familiar with where Stanwood is? Okay. Yes, I know Glenn is. <laughs> and also Darcy, who's in the room. Darcy Sonier has helped me with this. She took me on a tour. We went to Miller Weldmaster and saw their display there that's like museum quality display of their, their family history and the history of their company. Um, so if you get, it, get a chance and bug them, I'm sure they'll love me for telling you that. But <laughs> uh, So you have the Oberlands coming. And I did put this up here. That I have this great resource right now um, that I can sign you into at the library, historygeo.com. Anybody ever use that? They have a first landowner's project that's amazing. It shows you who first owned the land. You click on it and you can, it takes you to the Bureau of Land Management and you can see the original document. And I can sign you in at the library. Did you hear that, the library? <laughs> so the Oberlins come. You actually have several Oberlins. Um, I focus in on, there was John Adam Oberlin, which he's the one that connected with Darcy over because with, she's the regent for the DAR and he has recognition, the monument there at the, at the cemetery. And this piece of land is where the cemetery is now. Sorry, I moved away from the microphone again. So you have first Frederick, and I forgot a letter there. Whoops, typo. Fred, Frederick, who is Adam's son, comes to the area in 1805. And I found him in this index, May 20th, 1805, right, section 20, township 11, range 8 which I can explain all that to you at another time if you're interested. All right, so, sorry. So Frederick came first, and then you have Adam, who the legend has it, 
Adam was a bodyguard to George Washington. So there's that connection. And gotta love Glenn's memory. If I could like store it somewhere, he's like, yeah, I believe I read that in the paper somewhere around July 4th, 1976. I went to the paper July 4th, 1976. There it was. When the Oberlins arrived, you can see 1815, the stands right here have a piece of land. The stands and the woods were already here. Now, with Glenn's story, one of these families were squatters, and I, I don't know for sure. He says it was the stands, but maybe it's the woods. I have to, I have to still get that out of there yet. I don't know. Um, but I do see a Leonard stands here, 1813. We got the Hoovers which Glenn recognizes. I've helped him with the Hoover name on gene genealogy. Um, so this area, right, they come, the Oberlins become kind of a prominent family in the area. They go to apply for a post office. Well, there's already an Oberlin, so they take the name Stans and Woods, two of the earlier settlers, combine them for the name Stanwood. And that is the story that Glenn told me. And I, every time I think about the original story, he told it better, I promise. I get all interested and excited about researching this area. So if you have any knowledge or information, I am still heavily researching this area. I'm going to move on though, because I could talk all day about this area, but this is one example of people coming right from another area, right? We got a lot of people from Pennsylvania that came, a lot of people from the East coming into the area, settling and making their home here. And of course, I love looking at these. You know, James Madison, to all whom thee presents shall come, greeting. You know, they start like that. And you have the president signing these early on, up, in, up through Jackson. Jackson was about 20,000 behind, and they thought, ah, we better, better uh, get a secretary to help him out. So. So the early people to come to this area. You have religious groups, the Moravians. Um, they're going to establish about five missions um, between 1772 and 1781. If my husband were here, he would say these like really funny. Like he doesn't say Schönbrunn and Janaten Hutton because he's from Janaten Hutton. He's like Schönbrunn and Genaten Hutton. Yeah, if you want to, you want to say it for me. Go ahead. I couldn't get him to come say it so. Um, Schönbrunn is established. This gentleman, John Heckwelder, he was involved in this. He actually came in 1764, the first time, tried to establish a mission at, around Bolivar area, but was unsuccessful. Then with Zeisberger, is going to return and be part of establishing Schönbrunn, Janaton's Salem, not Salem that you're probably thinking of, but near Port Washington, Salem. This is and this map here, he drew in 1796, while not an official survey map, shows some important points. He was very familiar with the area. It's seen as very historically significant. I found him on the DAR website. Yeah, they recognized him. He also helped negotiate some treaties with some of the tribes in Ohio because of his connections there. And he will play a part in establishing Janaton Hutton don't tell my husband I said that. The, uh, the town that's there today, and he, building the first building there in 1798. Quakers, we already talked about, right? They play a, a part in settling this area, um, especially after 1785 when slavery was officially off the table. I feel weird that we have the religious groups and the banditti on the same slide, but that was for time. Squatters. Like banditti is a, a, a derogatory term that was used for squatters, right? Kind of a plural of, of bandit, the banditti. And I, I, I actually looked it up in the paper, the old papers, and you see banditti come up in the papers as they're talking about people, the banditti, those banditti, right? Now you can go around and call people that. <laughs> as early as the French and Indian War, you start having people, right, around that time, moving into this area. Um, again, not having a legal claim, but coming in and settling. I 
read in one of the books, and I thought it, the concept was kind of interesting, the Europeans, when they came to the New World, kind of saw it as up for grabs. And that is kind of how the banditti, the squatters, looked at this area. Well, nobody's there. Um, you do have them being a problem, and they were afraid that they were going to organize. Some even were afraid that they might even try to make their own country, right? That they were, you know, they, they created urgency behind settling this area, you know. And in 1785, they even tried to remove them with the military. Some refused to leave, some just came back. Yeah, so they were a stubborn group. I told you I'd tell you about the Ohio Company. Um, 1788, 1792, they're going to make some purchases. You can see this is a zoomed in map here. Um, they form in 1786 with the intent of gaining land in the West for settlement. A lot of military veterans in this group, Revolutionary War veterans. 1787, they contract to make their first purchase which is 1.5 million acres is what they contracted for. And this is the first land sale made directly by the Continental Congress. They only ended up with 750 of it because they couldn't make their second payment. So they just took the half they paid for. Then they ended up making a second purchase. Um, one of the key things here is they did allow them to use some of the military land bounties for part of this land. So you have the first 48, General Putnam, Reverend Cutler, and 46 Revolutionary War veterans coming first, coming to Marietta, arriving April 1788. Marietta shows their affiliation, their, their love of the French, right? Mar Marie Antoinette, did you guys know that? Marietta, Marie Antoinette? I know at least one person in the room who probably knew that. <laughs> He's shaking his head. Washington County, here's a little way to remember things. How much time do I have? I'm running out, aren't I? Eight more I can have eight more minutes, uh-oh. 1788, right, you have the first county, Washington County, Washington was the first president, ah. Oh. So the first of 88 counties was established in 1788, and it's Washington, oh, see? Now you'll never forget. They're going to follow the rules of the Ordinance of 1785. The donation tract is probably the part that fascinates me the most about this group. Not the land they purchased, no. The government gives them an extra 100,000 acres in 1792. Right here. You remember I said they like to make buffers? Yeah. Okay, if you come here and settle and carry a gun and protect Marietta from invaders, we'll give you the land. What do you think? Sound like a deal? Yeah. So this map is kind of cool because it shows the second purchase. It shows what their intended purchase was, what they en finally ended up with. But I gotta move forward because we got more stuff to talk about. Revolutionary War veterans. We have the Virginia Military District in the state. We have the Ohio Military District. You can find this, this one here comes from, you can see the Commonwealth of Virginia. But then down here, this one, see Thomas Jefferson, you have, for military service, it says there, I promise, I was gonna zoom in, but we don't have time. Right, so land is payment for service, but not just military service. If you go on the DAR website, it's great sometimes to read what people got recognized for. They gave them a horse, you know, they gave up, you know. All right, Arnold Henry Dorman, if I'm pronouncing that right, hopefully, um, he was a Dutch-born merchant in Portugal, and he was so supportive of the American cause, he used his own money to feed, clothe, nurse some soldiers who had been captured by British cruisers. After the war, he asked for reimbursement. They paid him part in cash and part in land. And you can see up here, this is the, that's my writing up there, that, that's not official old school writing there. Um, this area that he was given, partly in Tuscarawas, partly in Harrison County, in the Seven Ranges area. Gave him a whole township. Here you go. Debt paid, sort of. <laughs> um, 
Um, the practice of giving land for service really predates the story that I'm telling the revolution. George Washington is kind of a nice story on that. He had about 15,000 acres in Virginia that he got for service in the French and Indian War. He earned the right to claim land with the revolution, but he did not claim it. He did purchase three, I believe it was three tracks from other veterans. Problem is there were some, we'll just say paperwork issues. He lost the claim to that land. And, um, but his, he did have a nephew who, who actually was a lieutenant, Lieutenant George Washington, who did end up with getting some land here in Ohio. But George lost his claim, but I guess he got 15,000 in Virginia for the prior service, I don't know. State level, federal level, after 1803, most people, they didn't want, necessarily want to make that trip. Remember what Margaret said about it? Yeah, so uh, they sold or exchanged after it was legal to do so. So you'll see a lot of deeds that say assignee of, yeah. Tuscarawas County, you can see on the map here, is in the military district. So you can find on Tuscarawas County patents and deeds, right, military service awarded. I, I've heard a lot of stories about Stark County, but I have not yet been able to verify any of them. I will keep you posted. I'm getting there. How much time do I have? Two minutes? Two minutes. Speculators, developers, homesteaders, farmers, right? Another group that came here, groups, I should say. Stark County, you guys recognize these names? Now we're getting to the people you know. There's a little wells. A lot of surveyors were in this group because they would get paid for surveying with land. And if you go into that program I told you, historygeo.com, that website, and you enter Bezalil, Bezalil Wells in there, there's a whole list that comes up of his name, of property he had. Same with Thomas Roach, James Duncan, Phillips Lesser, they're all names that show up. And Wells, of course, he is going to establish Steubenville, but then with Shorb, Canton, right, helps to found Canton. This is the slide where I probably could have put 100 pictures Forgive me for all the ones I did include. I've got a James Duncan deed here. You can see I pinpointed it on the map for you. It's kind of south of Maslin there to the west of Richville. So that's an actual, I guess, digitization of the original. This is from History Geo and it ha shows the original lots here. And you can see right here where we are, a John Scott, 1811. Mayhew Folger, sound familiar? Okay, Thomas Roach, Thomas Roach, Thomas Roach, Thomas Roach, Thomas Roach, Thomas Roach. See him? He's everywhere. He's another one when you search on there, he shows up, right? And we know the story there, yeah, came here, Charity's Health, probably a little bit for his sense of adventure. What do you think, maybe? And yeah, no slavery. I'm gonna fast forward so that I don't take up all your time. Um, the Homestead Act of 1862, that's where I said, we, you know, you fast forward to the land's free. So you went from a dollar an acre all the way up to $2 an acre, and then we just want people to settle. So if you go and you, you build a home and make improvements and live there for five years for a small registration fee, so not free, just a small registration fee, the land is yours. And of course, with Civil War soldiers, um, they could use their time served as part of that five-year requirement, so. Where can I find out more? In case I was done early, I hyperlinked every single one of these, but that did not happen. I actually probably skipped some of the good stories, too. Um, but the Sir County Auditor and Recorder are very different websites. One has more than newer, where one the recorder, you can go all the way back to 1809 on some things. Um, the Bureau of Land Management, History Geo, if you haven't gotten it, that's my resource, right? My featured resource right now. Hathi Trust, anybody play on Hathi Trust ever? Yes, I see some hands. Hathi Trust is amazing for finding some of those old textbook or uh, history books. 
um, local history books where you find your families mentioned. That's always fun. Um, family Search and Ancestry both have land records. But the key with Family Search, at least, you know, about two thirds of their stuff is not actually indexed. So you have to go into the collection and search old school. Do you remember what search in old school is like? Where you have to actually go through and look at the old documents and go page by page until you find the one and then you scream Eureka and everybody looks at you. <laughs> and I'd be glad to help anyone with that who wants help. The DAR website, Ohio History Connection, they have a lot of stuff. If you, I'm, I'm planning a trip there. I'm, I'm probably going to steal the van from the library and fill it and go down and research. The Maslin Museum and the Maslin Library. And my last little thing here, this, there's a book written by Colin Woodard. He was a journalist. I'm a historian, so I was skeptical about his book, right? But he writes this book about the American nations, where he takes North America and breaks it into 11 different nations. And this is, he's explaining why we can't agree on things politically, right, um, based on settlement and migration. And isn't that kind of what we're talking about today? Migration into Ohio. If you look at Ohio, right here, we have three different groups that settled in this state, predominant groups. Not saying everybody that lives in an area is the same. That light blue is a Quaker influence. Then you've got the Puritan influence, and then the Appalachian. App uh, people who live, or Appalachia, depending on how you say it, um, in that area are very focused on individual liberty, right? Where Puritans have a little different mindset historically, and Quakers, so you can kind of see. So I like this map, because it kind of reminds us of where we came from. Whew. I'm over, I'm sorry. I only had like 50 pages of notes to condense into a half an hour. Fine job, you did. If I had a history that been that interesting in school, I would have really enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Just imagine all the resources we have between the library and the museum, and wow, you know how to find it all. So.